Good morning, and happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. Hope you're having a good day so far. This is not going to be a Father's Day message, but there is something out there for fathers, so stick around after the service. There's going to be, I was going to say treats, but it looks like more than that. I saw brats and all kinds of stuff, so. Our passage this morning, since we're not doing a Father's Day message, we will continue with 1 Corinthians, and we're starting 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And our passage is verses 1 through 5. If you want to turn there, we will read it together. 1 Corinthians 14, verses 1 through 5. This is Paul writing to the Corinthians. He says, Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now, I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets, so that the church may be built up. Father, as we come to your word this morning, we ask you to give us understanding. Uh, we, we can't drum that up. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned, and we need your spirit to do that. And I know each one of us is in a different place here this morning, and we all need something else. And so we ask you, by the power of your word and your sovereignty and your goodness, to minister your word to our hearts, that you would be glorified and that we, as a community of believers, would be built up. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to read to you um, a paragraph here, and I want you to tell me if this paragraph makes any sense to you. Here's the paragraph. A seashore is a better place than the street because you need lots of room. At first, it's better to run than walk. You may have to try several times. It takes some skill, but it's easy to learn. Even young children can enjoy it. Birds seldom get too close. If there are no sags, snags, it can be very peaceful. But if it breaks loose, you won't get another chance. You have any idea what I'm talking about? It's kind of big. It's pretty tough to figure that out. See, the problem here is you don't have any context for what I'm talking about. In understanding any kind of literature, you need context. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the paragraph again, but only this time I'm going to provide the context. And I don't have to go into great detail. In fact, I am only going to give you one word for context, and let's see if it makes more sense. That one word is kite. So let's see if it makes more sense. Kite. A seashore is a better place than a street because you need lots of room. At first, it's better to run than to walk. You may have to try several times. It takes some skill, but it's easy to learn. Even young children can enjoy it. Birds seldom get too close. If there are no snags, it can be very peaceful. But if it breaks loose, you won't get another chance. Yeah, makes all the sense in the world, right? If you have that context. It didn't take a lot of explaining to get the context. The context allows you to understand the paragraph, and that is especially important when we come to understanding what the Bible has to say to us. So many people pick up the Bible, and immediately they want to know from this passage, this random passage that I flipped to, what does God have to say to me today? And unfortunately, that's the way a lot of people have their quiet times. Just this hit or miss, open the scriptures and point to a verse and have God speak to me. And what they're doing there is they're skipping that all-important stage of understanding what God was saying to the original readers before moving on to the understanding of the passage. We have to understand what the passage originally said to the first readers before we can ever try to... Um, decipher what God's trying to say to us. We need to understand the historical context, the literary context, the cultural context of the original writing if we're ever going to understand what the meaning of the passage is before we can understand what God's trying to say to us. Of course, the old adage always holds true that any text taken out of context is a pretext for error. You pull a passage out just in its raw self, randomly, out of context, and look at it, there's a really good chance you could be off target with that passage. And chapter 14 is a great example of this. 
it would be possible to read 1 Corinthians 14, and you see in there that Paul mentions the gift of tongues 16 times in this passage, in this chapter. And he mentions the gift of prophecy 13 times. So based on that numerical data, you could easily conclude by ripping this passage, this entire chapter, out of its context, that this passage is Paul's treatise on tongues and prophecy. Because tongues and prophecy must be so important to the body of Christ and the building up of the church. And you'd be making a huge mistake. See, Paul doesn't go into this kind of detail about these gifts because they're such important gifts to our lives or to the life of the church. But because these were very important things for the Corinthians. It was the Corinthians who were making such a big deal about the spiritual gifts. And so Paul is addressing that, that problem in Corinth. What he's really trying to do here is to take their focus on the gifts and shift it to a focus on love. And that's really what chapter 14 is all about. That is the context of this chapter. Love. Chapter 14 comes on the hills of chapter 13. Duh, right? But chapter 13 was that great chapter on love. And what follows that? Chapter 14. In chapter 13, Paul said, the gifts, if you exercise them without love, are nothing to you. Now in chapter 14, in verse 1, Paul starts, pursue love. That's the context. Don't miss this. Some people have deduced that while chapter 13 was about love, now Paul completely shifts and starts a whole new topic, and he's going to teach about tongues and prophecy. And that is simply not what is going on here. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> chapter 14 is really Paul giving us an example of what he said in chapter 13. In chapter 13, he said, the gifts must be exercised and controlled in the context of love. Here's an example. And he chooses two gifts as his example of how love should empower the gifts and govern the gifts. Now, Paul's choice of tongues doesn't mean that tongues are a huge, hugely important gift to the body of Christ or to the life of a Christian. Not at all. Quite the contrary. Paul probably chose tongues because it was so important to the Corinthian believers. They had been making such a big deal out of this gift. In fact, they were using it as a status symbol. This was their pinnacle gift. In Corinth, if you wanted to be somebody, if you wanted to, everybody to see you as spiritual or powerful or important, then you had to speak in tongues. Which, of course, is very contrary to the whole idea of what love is that you would use a gift so people would think you're important. That is antithetical to the concept of love. God's desire is that we use the gifts to serve people, not to glorify the gifts. For instance, if you were doing a project in your backyard, like let's say building a shed. I'm doing that right now, so it's fresh on my mind. I don't know why I picked the hottest week of the year, but I did. Now, when you're building a shed, it's really nice to have a hammer, right? The hammer will help you get the job done a lot easier. It is really hard to get those nails into that wood if you don't have a hammer to do it with. Now, the focus is not on the hammer. It never should become on You can use any old hammer. The focus is always going to be on the shed. Is the shed square? Is the shed functional? Does it look good? You have tools, sure, but the focus is the product, it's the shed. And it is exactly the same thing in Paul's message here in 1 Corinthians 14. The building up of the church. The gifts make the job of building up the church a lot easier. But the focus is not on the gifts. The focus is on building the church, building up the community of believers. See, the gifts were not given to make you feel spiritual or important or powerful. Not to make you feel anything at all. The gifts, your gift is not for you. Your gift is for the body. Your gift was given to you so you would be better at serving others. So you would be a better lover. God assigns all of us tasks, jobs to do. And then he equips us to do those tasks. He gives us gifts, spiritual hammers, if you will. And it makes the job a lot easier. 
But the point is not the gifting. The point is the serving. The important point is the loving, that others would be built up, that the church would be built up. If you would, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Great passage, famous. I hope you've memorized it. Ephesians chapter 2. If you ask most North American Christians why God saved them, most Christians can only come up with one answer to that, and I know this because I ask when I speak at conferences and I speak in different places, I, I like to ask, why did God save you? And most Christians can only come up with one response to that, to get me to heaven or to get me out of hell. That's why God saved me. Now, there are lots of reasons why God saved us. Ephesians chapter 2 gives us another one of those reasons. Sure, God saved you to get you into heaven and out of hell. Yes, absolutely. That's only one. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 gives us another one. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. What a great passage. What a great truth. You got saved... Not because you did anything, but simply because of the grace and the generosity of God. He came and he did it all for you, and now he graciously and generously offers to us the gift of forgiveness, and all you have to do is accept it by faith. No work required. No assembly necessary. Just accept the gift. Now look at verse 10. In verse 10 he says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared be beforehand in order that we should walk in them. Hmm. When you got saved, when you were born again by the power of the Holy Spirit, a new life was given to you. You were literally reborn, remade your new creation, a new creature, a new work, he says here. And you are God's workmanship. When you were reborn, he made you a new work, a new creature, a new creation. And why? To what end? You are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. Yeah. You were born again for good works. That's the purpose behind it. You were given new life in Jesus Christ. One of the reasons was so that the world around you, this dark, despondent, discouraged world, hopeless world, would be able to see God in you since God is spirit and he's invisible. He made you an image bearer of his goodness and his nature. And so he gave you and me works to do so that people could see Christ in us. These are works that God prepared in advance for us to do. So if you are a born-again child of God, you were created at your rebirth for a purpose. And the purpose is doing good works for the people around you to see. You were born again in the likeness of God to become an image bearer. As John 1, at 1 John says, this type of living, type of living as an image bearer, is fueled and powered by the love of God living in us. See, the, the Corinthians wanted to prove their spirituality to each other. It was kind of a competition for them. But their preoccupation with the, with the gifts was really a sign of their immaturity. Look at verse 20 in 1 Corinthians 14. Paul chides them. He says, brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. I like the way the NIV states that first part of that verse. Stop thinking like children, the NIV says. What a great rendition of that. See, the true mark of spirituality or spiritual maturity is not your gift or how many gifts you have or how you employ them. The true mark of spiritual maturity is love, as evidenced by serving others. That's what spiritual maturity is. So Paul says in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 14, pursue love and then earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. Pursue love as in the case of a hunter pursuing his prey. That is the word that's used here. Hunt love. It is active, it's aggressive, it's persistent, and it's continual. He says, pursue love, 
and desire the gifts. Now, there's a big difference between, between pursuing something and desiring something. He doesn't say pursue the gifts. He doesn't say make the gifts your aim or your focus. He says pursue love. Oh, yeah, and it's okay to desire the gifts because the gifts will make it easier for you to accomplish your goal, which is to love. But the first thing you do is love. The first thing you do is help. The first thing you do is serve. Don't go on this great quest for your gift. Go on a quest for love. And as you love and as you help and as you serve, God will equip you to be able to do that in whatever context that you find yourself in. Don't make gifts the focus. Make love the focus. I don't know about you, but this is very different from the way that I've always viewed 1 Corinthians 14. Because I've always looked at 1 Corinthians 14 as a chapter on tongues and prophecy. As Paul's definitive teaching on tongues and prophecy, it's not. Tongues and prophecy are simply examples of how the gifts are supposed to be used in love. The context here and the purpose of this chapter is still love. And then he sets the tone for the rest of the chapter. He says there in verse 1, Desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Verse 2, For one who speaks in a tongue, in another language, speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. Most of this chapter, chapter 14, Paul is going to draw a contrast between prophecy and tongues. And he's going to use them to illustrate this principle of how to use your gifts in the context of love. Some in Corinth did have the gift of tongues. That meant they had the gift, the ability from the Holy Spirit to speak a language that they didn't know and that the people around them didn't know. That's what tongues is. It's an utterance, a speech gift that is given by the Holy Spirit that allows a person to speak a language they don't know. Now, it was used in the book of Acts as an indication that the new covenant had actually come upon us. In the book of Joel, Joel predicted, not this Joel, the prophet predicted, that um, the Holy Spirit would come upon the people at the outset of the new covenant and that they would speak in tongues. And so, on the day of Pentecost, in the book of Acts, the people spoke in tongues as a fulfillment of the prediction that Joel made. And then in the book of Acts, Right there on the day of Pentecost, those people with the gift of tongues went out on the street and they evangelized in a language they didn't know. But there's a lot of people visiting in Jerusalem at the time and they could hear the gospel presented to them in these foreign languages that the disciples didn't know. They were just speaking from the Holy Spirit and they were sharing the gospel. It was a tool in the book of Acts of evangelism. Confirmation of the new covenant covenant and evangelism. But as time went along, apparently the gift became more private. And by the time we get to the church at Corinth, Paul describes the gift more as a prayer language than as a tool for evangelism. Verse 2, look at it it again. It says, One who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. A person speaking in tongue is not speaking evangelistically, according to Paul, but rather is being spoken to God, as in a prayer or worship or praise. The person speaking the language, the person speaking in tongues, didn't know what they were saying, and the people around them didn't know what they were saying. They're speaking to God. Prophecy, on the other hand, is for other people. Look at verse 3. It says, on the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people. Tongues, you speak to God. Prophesy is speaking to people. For what? For their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. Verse 4. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself. It's aimed itself. But the one who prophesies builds up the church. So Paul encourages them to, to seek prophecy above tongues because prophecy builds others up and it builds the church up. Now that's not to say that there's something wrong with tongues. There isn't. Tongues will build up your faith. It's a form of praise. It's a form of worship. And that's always a good idea. You shouldn't feel bad if you have the gift of tongues. It was a gift given to you by God. But... If the criterion for evaluating the gifts is love for others, as we saw in chapter 13, you evaluate your use of the gift by whether you're exercising that gift in love. If that's the criterion, then the gift that builds others up rather than the gift that builds yourself up is the one that you ought to desire. 
And so Paul says, desire prophecy above tongues. The gifts were given to the body for the building up of the body. It's not the gift that does the building. It's the saints in the body who do the building. Saints who are empowered by the Spirit of God and motivated by love are the ones who do the building. Do you remember what Paul said in chapter 8? Chapter 8, verse 1. Go ahead and turn there. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1. Paul says, now, now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The Corinthians were proud of their knowledge. They were proud of this gift of knowledge that God had given them, or at least they perceived that God had given them. And Paul says, but that kind of knowledge inflates you. It, it strokes your ego but it doesn't build you in the faith. It doesn't make you more mature in Christ. Knowledge without love is nothing. We saw that in chapter 13. It just gives us a big head. But love is focused on building into the lives of others and building into the life of the church. The measure of love is not a measure of warm fuzzies. The measure of love is are you building into the lives of the people God has put into your sphere of influence? so that they are growing toward maturity in Christ. That's the measure of love. And that's what chapter 14 is all about. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul is still talking about love in the context of building into the lives of others and in building into the life of the church. And it's a thread that runs throughout the entire chapter. Let's go ahead and look at it real quickly. Look at verse 3. He starts out in verse 3. He says, The one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding. And then the thread continues in verse 4. In verse 4, he says, the one who prophesies builds up the church. And it keeps going in verse 5. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets so that the church may be edified or built up. Same thread. Verse 12, we continue with it. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Verse 17, same thing. For you may be giving thanks well enough if you're speaking in tongues, if you're praying to God in tongues, you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up, and that's the goal. And it goes on in verse 26. What then, brothers? When you come together, each one has a hymn or a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. Let all things be done for building up for building into the lives of others, into the life of the church, into the community, the fellowship of which you are part. Very clearly, this is what Paul means when he says in verse 1, pursue love. In the process of pursuing what is best for other people, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts because the spiritual gifts will make your job of loving other people by serving them easier. Paul's not saying desire the gifts for yourself so that you can feel good about yourself, so you can feel more spiritual. He's saying desire the gifts so you can love better. You'll be better equipped to carry out this task of loving other people. Now, why does he recommend the gift of prophecy here? Why does he pick prophecy out of all that he could have chosen? Well, it is a gift that can build other people up. It strengthens them to grow in their maturity in Christ, as we saw in verse 3, in verse 4, and in verse 5, prophecy builds up. So that raises the question, what then is prophecy? What exactly is it? I mean, I don't know about you, but when I try to imagine in my mind what prophecy looks like, two things come to mind. I either see an old gray beard from the Old Testament sitting on a mountain predicting something about the future of Israel or something about the future of Messiah, or I see a hippie in the 60s, with his hand over me, saying, you know, I have a word of the Lord for you. Thus saith the Lord, and then he pronounces some proclamation about me and my life or a decision I'm supposed to make. And those are the two visions that I get of what prophecy is. And if that is our vision of what prophecy is, then it really becomes very mystical and strange and rare. If you look at the Old Testament prophets, they didn't predict a future very much. 
any given prophet in a lifetime of being a prophet in Israel or Judah may have only made a future proclamation one time, maybe two or three times in their entire ministry over years and years and years of serving God. So what did they do with all the rest of their time? What was the bulk of the job for an Old Testament prophet? Well, the bulk of their job was simply to present to the people of God the counsel of God. That's what they did. So what Paul describes for us here in 1 Corinthians is not rare or mystical or magical. In fact, it's very common and it is an integral part of the life of the church. It should be happening all the time. Every time we get together, whether it's in this building or somewhere else, prophecy should be going on. What Paul describes here, he says in verse 3, he says, on the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their edification, for their encouragement, and for their consolation. It's not some mystical prediction. It's simply the ability to see that another person has needs and then to take the truth of God and apply the truth of God to that specific situation and that specific need. That's what prophecy is. Prophecy, then, really is the ability, the gift, to give godly counsel that builds other people up, that builds into their life, that builds them toward maturity in Christ. It could be an exhortation, if we take it out of verse 3 there. There are three things Paul mentions. Maybe it's an exhortation. You come to me and you exhort me, maybe to change my behavior. Or maybe you exhort me to go talk to a certain person about a certain thing, or you exhort me to study a passage, or to memorize a verse, or to change my attitude, or something. That is prophecy. Or it could be a word of encouragement, as Paul says here. Paul lays it on your heart to approach me and to minister strength to me because you perceive, aided by the gift of the Holy Spirit, that there is something in my life, that there's an area of weakness or sadness or maybe discouragement in my life. Maybe you don't even know why I'm sad or why I'm discouraged. But you know that I'm down because the Spirit gives you that discernment. And so you come to me and you apply the truth of God's Word to my discouragement and you become His encourager in my life and I'm built up because of God's gift in you. That is also prophecy. Or it could be consolation. Maybe you sense a sorrow, a grief, a deep loss in a brother or sister's life. So you go to that person. And because of the grace of God, you minister God's truth to that area of loss, to that hurt, and they're built up in their pain and their grief. That is the gift of prophecy. Now, the gift of prophecy can manifest itself, like in these examples that I gave you, one-on-one, face-to-face, individually, between two believers, or it can manifest itself in public ministry, in teaching or preaching, for example. Let's say I'm preparing a, a, a sermon, a message for a sermon or a message for a Sunday school class, and in the process of preparing, the Holy Spirit lays a specific theme on my heart, a specific truth, and I have the strong impression, it's subjective, the strong impression that this is something God wants me to share in this message. And so I pursue that. Because of a work that God wants to do in our midst, the person rendering a public um, message is prompted by God to apply God's truth to a specific situation in the lives of the people to which that person is speaking. And that's prophecy. Here's the point. Both prophecy and tongues are gifts of utterance. They're gifts of speech, words coming out of our mouth. Tongues, on the one hand, are private, they're unintelligible, and they're aimed at self. Prophecy, on the other hand, are others-oriented, they're intelligible, they're articulate, and they're always based on the truth of God's word. That's the difference between the two. And so Paul says in verse 5, Now, I wish that all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy. Greater is the one who prophesies than the one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets, so that the church may receive edifying. Now, 
you have to understand, Paul is speaking in hyperbole here. He's not arguing against himself. He already made the, the point back in chapter 12 that not everybody has the same gift. He already argued back in chapter 12 that, that um, we don't all have the same gift. And so he's not saying that he literally wants everyone in Corinth to speak in tongues. He's not saying there's something lacking in your life if you're not speaking in tongues. Not at all what he's saying. He's speaking in hyperbole. He exaggerates and he says, I would that you could all speak in tongues, but, that's an opposition word, but I know that's not possible. He says, but even more that you would prophesy. Now he realizes that's not going to happen either. Since we're making up hypotheticals here, Paul says, I would rather that everyone spoke words of encouragement than that you spoke in a language nobody could understand. He's exaggerating here to make a point. Why? Why does he speak about tongues this way? Because tongues aren't going to build up the church, and prophecy is. Tongues aren't wrong. Tongues are a gift from God. Paul spoke in tongues. Look at verse 18, chapter 14. Paul says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. I don't think that meant Paul was speaking. He spoke in tongues all the time. But he does say, I speak in tongues. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words to you that you could understand than 10,000 that you can't understand. People at Corinth were speaking in tongues to be seen by others, and it was puffing them up, and it was, it was self-centered and self-oriented. And Paul says, I would rather speak in a little way that would build into somebody's life, that would build up the church, because it's way better. Now remember, when we read this, I keep saying Paul, Paul, Paul. This isn't Paul's personal opinion on this matter. Paul, as he writes these things, is inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. God is using this situation at Corinth to lay out for us what is important for us and for the church. And what is important for us and for the church is that the gifts exist to build up the body. The gifts exist for the good of others. And the gifts are supposed to be exercised in love and motivated by love. And so the building up of the body is not the responsibility of just a few ministers. The building up of the body is the responsibility of the body. Every single Christian in here is gifted by God for works of service. You have been assigned good works that were prepared in advance for you to do, and God will equip you to do that. And you might say, well, pff, I don't know what my gift is. Listen, it's okay. You're responsible, you're responsible to the commandment of God. What is the command in this passage? Pursue love. That's the command. Pursue love by working to build other people up in their lives in Christ. That's your part. The gifting is God's part. Don't worry about God's part. That's something he does, not something you have to do. As you serve people, as you get connected into people's lives, as you get connected into building them up, God will equip you for the task, whatever task it is he gives you to do. But start loving first. In other words, don't fall into the trap of trying to follow your gifts into service. I'm going to say that again. Don't fall into the trap of trying to follow your gifts into service. In other words, I discern what my gift is, and I'm going to seek areas to serve according to those gifts. Pursue love. He doesn't say follow the gifts. He says follow love. Pursue love. Start serving. Start loving. Start building people up, and the gifts will follow. God will give you what you need at the time when you need it. And it all tends toward the building up of the church community. Look at the last part of verse 12. I know it's not our section this morning. But Paul says there, strive to excel in building up the church. That is parallel to the first part of verse 1, pursue love. Strive to excel in loving the church by building her up. And this chapter, chapter 14, is specifically about building up the church with our words. Paul chose tongues because it was a big deal in Corinth. And then he chooses the corollary gift, which is prophecy. Prophecy. 
Paul's point here is that words are important. Your words to other people will either build them up or tear them down. Your words in this fellowship will either build us up or tear us down. We have to be constantly on our guard that our words are seasoned with love. I'm sorry, Becca. <laughs> I, I, I insulted her this morning. <laughs> I didn't really. But. See, when we exhort each other, and we're told to exhort each other, if we exhort each other in a lack of love, it's not an exhortation, it's just nagging. That's all it is. And if we praise each other, apart from love, it's just flattery. It's empty flattery, empty words. And it's really self-seeking. I flatter you so I get something back from you. Good feelings, warm fuzzies. And rebuke without love. What is that? It just becomes harsh and destructive and divisive. Knowledge without love, we've already looked at that several times over the last few weeks. Knowledge without love just puffs us up. Consolation without love, it's condescending. Patting people on the back. Criticism without love. Well, if you're not talking to the person, it's backbiting. If you are talking to the person, it's insulting. We are told to guard our mouths and the words that come out of our mouths. Prophecy is the gift that builds people up. Jesus said, whoever serves me must follow me. You want to serve me? Follow in my footsteps. Jesus always walked in love. That should be our pursuit as well. Pursue love, Paul says. Let's pray. Father, our hearts are yours. We want you to rule in our hearts. We want your peace to rule in our hearts. We want your, your strength and your security to rule in our hearts. Not for ourselves only, but so that we might minister to others from a position of being in your spirit, sensitive to your spirit. And we pray that you would make that possible in us. In Jesus' name, amen.